Why do we fight? It was a question that plagued our species, or rather all species in our world. Whether it was our ancestors that ran across the fields, chasing powerful prey with their peerless strength that even we, their descendants, can only dream of, or the arrogant bastards that claim to be the children of the wind itself because of their speed. We have always questioned why we fight. Why do we hunt? Why stress ourselves so much? For survival? For food? For territory? Yes, for all of these, but these were necessities, not a proper reason, just the way things are. And so, the question remains. And it has remained since time immemorial. Seasons changed. The world itself changed. Land tore itself apart. And seas claimed the world for a time. Then came the fireballs from the skies themselves that ended the reign of the great reptiles that ruled the natural world for as long as anyone could remember. A unique trait common in all species of this world is the gift of knowledge, the entire memories of every single being from our ancestors, preserved in our very blood and providing us with unfathomable knowledge to draw upon in times of need. A trait that was born just before the extinction of the great reptiles. For a time things were the same. Our ancestors would get up, hunt for food, laze around or search for their next meal, procreate with their mates and sleep, then repeat the cycle all over again when the sun rose next. Then came the anomaly. One species of tree hugger decided that they would no longer be prey, that they would rise against the nature of the very world. Every other species thought them fools and severed ties with them, something that was a devastating outcome for this group of tree huggers initially. Then, they adapted. As seasons changed, as generations passed, the tree huggers slowly changed. Then came the very first sign that something really bad was happening to them. When another group of tree huggers who had not strayed from the natural path tried to communicate with the abominations, they failed. And then, our ancestors realized the grave truth. The abominations had lost the ability to speak the natural tongue. Not only that, they had lost the gift, the vast stores of knowledge held within their blood, forever locked away from them. This became very apparent when they flailed around the great fields like infants without purpose. This was the last straw for our ancestors. They fully cut off the abominations from the natural world. The children of the sky would escape from the abominations the moment they approached, unlike with the rest of the beings. The people of the scales would intentionally poison any abomination they happened upon with their poisonous fangs. The people of the water would no longer provide the abominations with sustenance in the form of their old serving as nutrients for their growth. The great kings of the fields, my own ancestors, would no longer ignore the abominations outside of hunts for food and actively target them to exterminate them. But against all odds, they failed. Worse yet, the humans adapted once again. Once again, they would further stray from the natural way, crafting objects that would one day be known as tools from the bones of our ancestors, scavenging like the carrion-eater tribes of old. They would form unnatural structures from stones and sticks and communicate in voices, a monstrous imitation of the natural tongue. This hostility between the abominations and our ancestors became the new norm. Once again, ages went by until things once again changed. The prideful children of the wind were always arrogant, and many of our ancestors believed they deserved this arrogance. While the spotted tribe was known for its immense speed, it was only in short bursts. The children of the wind, on the other hand, could maintain ridiculous speeds for long periods of time, allowing them the privilege of being arrogant. But all their pride meant nothing in front of the abominations. These things, despite only having two legs and nowhere near enough speed to outrun even the weakest of our ancestor species, were somehow able to run far longer than any species could even imagine. In giving up the protection of fur and exposing pale skin to the air, they somehow gained an endurance that became the envy of the natural tribes, and they made good use of this endurance to hunt down many species for food. And then, things became worse when they learned to enslave the natural tribes. The first to be domesticated were the moon tribes. These ferocious predators that were fiercely loyal to their packs and were known to be the most dangerous predators of the world, for some reason, voluntarily bonded with the abominations, creating a bond that would haunt the natural world for countless seasons to come. 
watching their rivals, the Moon Tribes, in the company of the Abominations, my own ancestors decided that they would not fall behind and started changing their own form so that they too could bond with the Abominations, to varying degrees of success. The next target for domestication was the Children of the Wind. The memories of our ancestors clearly show this monumental moment in history, of how the prideful people were broken, their pride shattered, their arrogance nothing more than history, and their superior speed and endurance, nothing more than a tool of convenience for these abominations. This even further segregated the natural tribes from the abominations, but this time it was out of fear of the abominations instead of disdain. For a time, every species was afraid that they would be next, that they would become the next playthings for the abominations. Once again, things settled into a status quo, of the abominations now dominating the land and rivers, searching for the next target to enslave alongside the traitorous Moon Tribe's descendants that slowly started to change their forms, showing the effect of becoming the companions of the abominations. Just like a few of my own ancestors, Slowly the world changed, seasons passed, and the abomination stopped changing in form, settling into one distinct pattern. Two legs, two arms, and two eyes, which appeared to be subpar in any one category, but had the uniqueness of incorporating the most forms of visions possible, allowing them to see in nearly all natural conditions. By this point the natural tribes had learned to fear these abominations, these humans and stopped any attempt at communication a long time ago. It was the same case for the descendants of the Moon Tribe. Naturally, this meant that the Moon Tribe's descendants, just like their masters, had forgotten the natural tongue. Our ancestors watched, hidden behind the trees under the ground, and flying in the skies, as the humans stopped using sticks and stones, preferring to craft their dens with stones and viscous materials that allowed them to build stronger and much more resilient dens. Artificial caves were built by the Abominations specifically for themselves and the Moon Tribe. Eons went by as the world changed. Now the natural tribes live in small communities, hidden away from the human eyes. Many choose to spend their days simply hunting for food and wasting away the days, drowned in their ancestral memories, reliving those days when they were the masters of the world and not the humans. In the human cities, things are different. Many daring natural tribes scavenge from what remains of the humans' waste for food, a stark contrast to the majority of the moon tribes in my kind, who lead comfortable lives in the homes of the humans, with no lack of food or water, no lack of sustenance or comfort. Many natural tribes had once called my ancestors and the ancestors of the moon tribe foolish for following the humans. Now those natural tribes live in constant despair and fear whether in the wilds that were left by human hands out of pity for these natural tribes, or those trapped in metal cages in a place known as Zoo. Our ancestors left behind the natural way so that we, their descendants, could lead this comfortable way of life. This is our right by inheritance. So what right do these little creatures of the other world, calling themselves the Draxi, or as the humans call them, the Space Hamsters, have that they call me and my brother a lazy waste of space. Looks like I need to show this little cretin of a garden world that has never struggled like our ancestors did. What it means to be a creature from Terra. Shit! Carl, control your cat! She's usually not like this, Sarah. Stop. No, put down the space hamster. They are not rats. No, don't eat it. Bad kitty, look at Fred. He's a dog, but he's not trying to kill the space hamster. Fred, no, that was not an invitation. Oh, Carl. If the Department of Xenozoology finds us because your German Shepherd and your stupid orange tabby cat ate one of the few space hamsters we have on Earth, we're done.